deeply and uh, even better that you come to know us in a particular way as the passage talks about. So help us to really see this as the, the real life and the real relationship that we have with you. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, so uh, remember, this, this book kind of breaks into three, well, two big parts, I guess. The first are reported problems, chapters one through six, really. Reported problems, reported from the people at Chloe's house. And then you have what you might call, in chapter seven and following, you have some issues or questions that were raised by the Corinthians in relation to Paul's first letter that was written to them, which is mentioned in chapter 5, verse 9, but we don't have it in the inspired scripture, so it comes before 1 Corinthians. Uh, but he'd already written them previously, and um, we don't need that book because God the Holy Spirit didn't seem fit to have it in the canon of scripture, so we don't need it. But it, may, it is mentioned, and in this particular letter, Paul made all sorts of remarks, I'm sure, and then they wrote him back and they said, hey, well, what about this? We kind of take issue with what you're saying here. And so Paul is gonna, has been addressing those. So chapter 7, verses, uh, verse 1 through 40, he deals with marriage, concerning marriage, and um, concerning virgins, and <laughs> things like that. We talked about all that. Interesting chapter, right? And then this chapter, he moves to another issue concerning food sacrificed to idols. So... In this section, Paul's main concern is the believers at Corinth whose knowledge has led to them becoming arrogant. And knowledge can often lead to arrogance, sort of a one-upmanship. Like, I know better, or I know more than you, and therefore you should listen to me. Um, what they were doing, of course, was acting in a certain way in pagan idol temples that was having a negative effect on other believers whose conscience wouldn't permit them to eat in these pagan idol temples. So actually what this demonstrated was that they didn't have proper knowledge because proper knowledge will use knowledge to love. It will not use knowledge to tear down fellow believers. It will use knowledge to love fellow believers and build them up. And so True knowledge, if we really have true knowledge, then it will take account of our fellow believers in Christ and it will give love, of, love to those fellow believers, priority over whatever our personal freedoms may be. So we'll go into this, the proper use of freedom in chapter 8 tonight. The first 13 verses and the first three verses talk about knowledge being without, uh, without love being arrogant. And then the idea uh, that there's no such thing as an idol, but hey, in this case, you can't eat or you shouldn't eat for the sake of your brother who has a weaker conscience. So you're probably familiar with this passage a little bit. Uh, before we get started, let me remind you that in all of these chapters, there is always citation of some theological truth. Usually it's, it's pretty brief, although sometimes he explores it. In this chapter, it's very brief. It's really just one phrase. And this theological truth is the underlying reason why we should never uh, cause a brother to stumble okay, on one of these amoral or morally neutral issues, which in this case was eating in an idol temple, which was nothing really because there's no such thing as an idol, right? But we know that. But still, uh, some believers' conscience was accustomed to the idol, meaning they couldn't eat without thinking, well, I'm also worshiping the idol. So it caused them to stumble, and it was damaging them. It was wounding them. All right, let's uh, look at it. Chapter 8, verse 1. Notice the words now concerning. Same words he used in 7.1. Now concerning. Same words he used in 7.23, now, or 25, now concerning. Peri day, which means, uh, in Paul's writings, a change of topic. He's changing the topic. And he's been discussing marriage and virgins. Now he's going to address... Uh, verse 1, things sacrificed to idols. He says, we know that we all have knowledge. Um, this is probably another one of those popular slogans at Corinth. We all have knowledge. Okay, We know that we all have knowledge. 
Um, I've mentioned these before. There were some other popular slogans there that Paul is addressing, uh, such as you know, chapter 6, verse 12, all things are lawful for me. That's his popular slogan the, the Corinthians were using. But Paul said, no, no, but not all things are profitable. They said, yeah, all things are lawful for me. He said, ah, well, I won't be mastered by anything. So at Corinth, they had a number of really popular slogans. Another one's in chapter 7, verse 1. Um, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, that was a, that's what the Corinthians said. This is not what Paul's saying. Okay, Paul's responding to their slogan, right? That slogan, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, we said means this is an this is a idiom for sexual relations. It doesn't mean like touching her on the shoulder. <laughs> it's not talking about that. He goes, that's why he goes on to address immediately the importance of having sex within marriage. So uh, you have a number of these popular slogans that Paul is addressing. You, you would like it in our modern day translations if they would you know, put quotes around those so you could see it better. But this is another one right here in chapter 8, verse 1. And once you see these, everything kind of makes sense. Oh, I see what he's doing. So the popular slogan at Corinth here in chapter 8, verse 1, has to do with knowledge, and it's, we know that we all have knowledge. Now, you, you get the, do you get the sense of arrogance from that? We know that we all have knowledge, Paul. So why doesn't everybody just get on board and just go down to the best restaurant in town and get the best meat? Who cares? See, we're acting on knowledge. We're behaving on the basis of the knowledge that there's no such thing as an idol. So it doesn't matter if we can go down to the pagan idol temple and eat the meat. It doesn't matter. So this is arrogance, and that's what he says. That's what Paul says next. Now, this is Paul. He says, knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So he wants to discuss the relationship between knowledge and our liberty and love. Okay? How we should live among one another. So knowledge makes arrogant. Now, um, let's talk, before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the sac uh, you know, things sacrificed to idols so we understand the, the background. There's a traditional view to chapters 8 through 11, 1, 8, 1 to 11, 1. That, that's all the same subject matter here, okay? It's all going to be about, you know, food sacrificed to idols and how you treat your fellow believer. Um, these things sacrificed to idols. Now, what is this all What's the background of this? Well, the traditional view of this verse is that the main issue is that what was happening was that meat or animals were sacrificed to idols. This was a daily practice in pagan temples throughout all the cities of the Roman Empire, right? A token portion of the meat would be burned on the altar to the god or the goddess. So that meat is consumed. Nobody can eat that. It was for the god or goddess. The rest of the meat that was not consumed went to the temple priests, to the attendants, and, the, and the, their families. Okay, so usually just the people that were directly involved in officiating at the, these sacrifices. However, these families and the attendants and so forth couldn't eat all the meat, usually, so what remained would be sold to the butchers, and they would take it to the meat market, and they would sell it in the open marketplace to common people. Now, this meat was very desirable because the animals that were offered for sacrifice were the best, best animals. Um, but the butchers did not usually identify the meat from the temple in the open marketplace. The only way you could decipher it is you may have to ask him or make a request for this meat. But um, the t traditional view is that these three chapters are about eating that meat that was sold in the marketplace. Now, that's the traditional view. And Paul is saying, now there's nothing wrong with the meat, but you shouldn't do this if it causes your brother to stumble. That's the traditional view. I don't agree with that view, and um, there are good reasons why. So I'm going to give you my view, and, and others, of course. And this view says that the main issue is eating the meat that was sacrificed to the idol in the pagan temple. Okay. Um, like if you look at verse 10, it's, it's quite clear that it's talking about in an idol temple. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? Now, that's the primary issue for most of these three chapters. At the end 
in chapter 10, there is a short section which discusses meat that was purchased in the marketplace. And you sit down to eat it in someone's private home. And there's another believer there. And the, the, the other believer says, hey, did, did you know that this meat was purchased in the marketplace and had come from the, the idol's temple? And Paul in that case says, well, now you can't eat. Whereas before you could have eaten if they didn't say anything, if nobody knew where the meat came from. But now because of the weaker brother's conscience, you can't eat it. So that's a secondary issue. Uh, but the primary issue is the problem at Corinth that believers who had knowledge that there's only one God were going up to the idol temple and eating at cultic festivals. And certain believers said, we can't do that. Okay, that, that um, wounds our conscience. You should, we, we, okay, and Paul's saying you, you shouldn't do that. You should not wound their conscience. So that's, that's my take on this passage, primarily dealing with eating in an idol temple. Um, now, we all know that we have knowledge, the popular saying. It's indicating arrogance. We knew, we already know that um, the Corinthians held an abnormally high view of knowledge, and therefore they became arrogant. Um, they'd missed the point of knowledge. The point of knowledge is not to tower over other people, to act like you know it all, but the, the point of knowledge is to be able to help others in this context, especially believers, right? So if one knows properly, they know that, end of verse 1, love edifies, meaning it builds up. So, but some believers weren't doing that. They were using their knowledge to cause other believers to stumble, right? Going into the idol temples and uh, eating this meat. Now, this was desirable meat. I mean, going up to the idol temple and eating was like going to the best restaurant in town. And everybody loves to go to the re best restaurant in town, right? Uh, I, went, I think I probably went to the best restaurant in town just about a month ago. Isn't there a place like called Churchill's or something like that? Oh, it's pricey. Um, but it was so good. Uh, who doesn't want to eat there all the time? And so these believers are like, well, let's go. Let's the best restaurant in town. Let's go. There's no such thing as an idol. It doesn't matter. We know, that, <laughs> we know there's one God, so it doesn't matter. We're just going to eat the food. We're just going to get the good stuff. <laughs> so what's the problem, right? Well, it was viewed by people in general in the culture as a cultic mill, and it was inseparable from worshiping the idol. And so now you've got other believers, Gentile believers, and they're in Corinth, and they're saying, oh, wait a minute, we're, they were accustomed to the idol. And in other words, they could not separate the eating of the meat from the worship of the idol, right? And so they, they, they could not do this in good conscience. But those who could were doing it. And this was not loving, Paul says. Okay? So this is all about the relationship between knowledge, you know, and there's nothing wrong with knowledge. Okay? Paul's not condemning knowledge. I don't know how many Christians I've actually seen use this verse to say we, we don't need doctrine because Paul said no, we, you know, knowledge puffs up. Paul's not condemning knowledge. He's, <laughs> he's saying that knowledge that's not being used properly for the purpose of love, which edifies, is not meeting the true goal of knowledge, okay? So if, a, if you really have knowledge, if you have true knowledge as a Christian, you will use that knowledge to not injure people, but build other people up. Verse 2. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he is not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God, known by him. Now, when a person supposes that he knows a subject matter, take your own particular areas of interest or your areas of education, and you think you know this, right? If someone acts like they have full command or knowledge of a subject, guess what? You can be sure they don't. There is always more to learn about any subject. No one can ever learn or know everything there is to know about an area or subject matter. There's always questions that 
you have not asked? There are always other aspects that you've not considered. So someone who purports to know it all is not only unrealistic, but they're also arrogant. And so, but there is one thing that at least all the believers at Corinth did know. One thing they knew that there is only one God. They did know that. Okay. Verse 4. There is no God but one. Okay. They did know that one thing. But some concluded that if there is only one God, then there's no idols, obviously. And that means we can go eat in a pagan idol temple because it's only the meat. It's just for the food. But they did not know as they should have known because they did not take into consideration how the exercise of that knowledge could injure other people. You see? There was a, a correct thing they knew. There's one God and no idols. Great. But they made a logical leap to the conclusion that we can go eat this meat. But that didn't take into consideration other factors. So they didn't really know the full implications. So they didn't know everything. Now, um, if we go through this passage, what you'll see, and I think you know from practical experience, when a person becomes a believer, they carry over certain stigmas from their prior life. And sometimes we learn a Christian truth, um, and maybe, let's just take alcohol as an example. Maybe as an unbeliever, you are an alcoholic. Now you become a believer. <clears throat> and you learn that it's actually okay to drink alcohol. You just can't get drunk. But that may not work for you. You may not be comfortable with that. Because your association with alcohol as an unbeliever is you get drunk all the time. So for you, it's not okay. Do you see? Right? But for other believers, it's okay. They can have a drink. It's no big deal. They're not getting drunk. And it doesn't cause them any trouble. Right? So you have two believers, and they're both following their conscience. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. What's wrong is that the stronger brother causes the weaker one to stumble. In this case, back into alcoholism. That's just an example. But we, we'll come up with some more as we work through this. So, you carry over certain stigmas from your unbelieving life, and what happens is you learn a truth from the Bible, and then, you, I mean, you know it, right? But your emotions don't, haven't caught up with your intellect yet. And your emotions won't allow you to live according to your intellect. And this is for everybody. We, we all go through this. Um, so it takes time for, let's just say, our emotions to catch up with our intellect in these matters. So verse 3. Um, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. He's known by God. Now, of course, God knows everyone. He's omniscient. That's not the type of knowledge it's talking about, is it? It's talking about a specific type of knowledge. So, what does it mean to be known by God? Well, it means that God takes note of that person. So, God does take note of certain believers. And He's not taking note of other believers. Who are the ones who He takes note of? Those who love God. Uh, now, how does one love God? What does the Scripture say over and over? If you love me, you will what? We just heard it last Sunday, right? I think in the upper... Uh, room discourse. If you love me, you will do what? Keep my commandments. Okay. One loves God by keeping his commandments. John 14, 15, John 14, 23. And when a believer keeps his commandments, guess what? God takes note of that individual. And further, not taught here, but in John 14, 21, it says that he will make himself further known to that believer. Um, do certain believers have access to more knowledge about God? Yes, 100%. Believers who keep His commandments, God discloses Himself to them and gives them greater understanding and knowledge. 
to which cannot be acquired by believers who do not keep His commandments. Hence, then, it's more important to be known by God than it is to know things about God because, guess what? If you're known by God, that's the avenue to actually know more about Him. So then what are we supposed to do? Well, just what he said in chapter 7, verse 19, what's important uh, is that we keep the commandments of God. It's there in 719 in the previous chapter. And of course in John 14. So the key is to keep the commandments. Well, how are you going to keep the commandments is what I always say. It's the next question I ask. How are you going to keep the commandments? Well, you got to know what they are. <laughs> how are you going to know what they are? You have to study the Bible. Um, there's no other way. It's not just magically going to happen. You have to study the Bible. You have to see what God requires of the believer. And, of course, we find this starting in the upper room discourse and then into the epistles. And uh, that's where his commandments are for the church. And so we need to keep his commandments. When we do that, we're loving God, according to the Bible. And then we are taken note of by God. And then he discloses himself to us. So that's how it happens. That's how it happens. Keep his commandments. So what, what do you know? What have you learned to keep? You keep that. God takes note of you because you're loving him in that way. And then he makes himself further known to you. And this is called spiritual growth, right? This is called growth. And it takes place over the course of your entire lifetime. So I always use, use the analogy when, when you became a believer, God wasn't growing a squash, which takes a few weeks. He's growing you an oak, which takes a lifetime. And that's our spiritual life. It's our growth and our spiritual life takes a lifetime. So those are the introductory verses, one through three. And now we'll move to the next section, which is uh, develops these ideas about the idol. Okay? Eating the meat and so forth. Therefore, which signals a logical conclusion. Right? Therefore, concerning the things, uh, the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that's true. The believers know, right, like he's saying, that there's only no God but one, okay, and, and there's no such thing as an idol. Now, Paul admits we all share this knowledge. Every, every believer knows this. Otherwise, you wouldn't have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you just wouldn't even be a Christian. But just because that's true does not mean that we're all convinced that it's okay to go down to a pagan temple and eat meat sacrificed to an idol because we, in that culture, we would associate that with worshiping the idol. Okay? And Paul's saying, no, technically the meat's fine. There's nothing. I mean, God, God made all the animals. There's nothing wrong with eating the meat, right? But if that's associated in someone's conscience with worshiping an idol, then it's not okay for them. Right? Verse 5, uh, explanation 4. For even if there are so called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God. In other words, he's admitting that out there in the world people do think there are other gods. Um, in, the new, in the first century, you know, in, throughout Rome, you had all the traditional gods and goddesses, right? They were called gods and goddesses. And then they had mystery religions, and their gods and goddesses were called lords. And that's why he says many gods and many lords there at the end of verse 5, because he's distinguishing between the traditional religions that were in the Greek and later Roman Empire, and then also from the mystery religions, where they called them lords. So out there, yeah, people believed in all this. Okay. In fact, we're going to find out over in chapter 10. Look in chapter 10, verse 20, just real quick that behind these uh, idols, these gods, these goddesses, and so forth, there are demons. Okay. He says, no, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to become sharers in demons. Okay. So behind these gods and goddesses, where there was the ancient ones in Egypt, you know, with Pharaoh and the Hebrews and all that, or it was the Greeks or the Romans, there are demons behind these idols. And they were behind these idols in order to receive worship, right? But, you know, we know as Christians, truthfully, there's only one God. That's what he's saying in verse 6, 5 and 6. Now, this one God 
verse 6, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. So he's played off the word God, gods and lords, and he said there's one God and there's one Lord. Okay, in verse 6. The one God, whom is the Father, and he says from whom are all things, meaning he's the source. He's the source of all things. He's the source of creation, right? And we exist for him. In other words, what's the purpose of our lives? Right? It's for him and not for ourselves and certainly not for idols. And then there's one Lord Jesus Christ, and it says, by whom are all things, meaning he's the agent, okay? and he's the agent of creation. He's the agent of all things. Okay? So in other words, you, you always have members of the Trinity involved in every work of God. Okay? So if, if we talk about creation, we've got God as the, the Father is the source, the Son is the agent, you know, the Word, what did God do? He spoke. So when you're looking at John 1, 1, or you go back to Genesis 1, you're seeing God speaking. This is God is the source of creation. The Son is being the agent of creation to bring about everything. But then you, you see the same thing in other things that God is, the members of the Trinity are involved in, only two of which are mentioned here. But you've got salvation. Well, God is the architect of salvation, Ephesians 1, 5 through 7. The Son is the... Uh, <coughs> the executor of salvation. He was the one who was crucified on our behalf. And then the Spirit is the applier of salvation, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. So really, Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 give you just an example, another example where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all involved in salvation. Um, but they're involved in all the events. And in this case, the Father's source, Son is the agent, and our purpose is for Him. Um, our lives are for Him and not for ourselves. And so how should we relate to you know meat sacrificed to idols well we should we should want to please him we should want to keep his word and then he will unveil himself to us and we will know him more fully now eight seven uh, note the contrast however not all men have this knowledge that is that there's one god and one lord jesus christ right the unbelievers do not know that there's just one god Okay. They worshipped all sorts of uh, gods and goddesses and, and lords of the mystery religions. Um, even some believers, of course, may not be entirely clear on this point in the sense that they are, as this verse describes, accustomed to the idol. Accustomed to the idol. And so even though they may know there's no other gods but one, they may have trouble shaking this belief that when we're eating this meat, that it's somehow not also an act of worship. No. So these brothers were not able to eat the meat without associating with worshiping an idol, and therefore they, their consciences were being defiled. And the main problem was that these stronger believers were the ones leading them into this. They were causing them to stumble. They were using their knowledge, but in an inappropriate way, which showed they didn't really have a true grasp of Knowledge, because knowledge properly used will use it to love and edify and build up, right? If we know anything, that's what we, how we should use our knowledge. Now let's talk a little bit about the conscience, because he's mentioned it here in verse 7. Their conscience being weak is defiled. Um, the conscience is a judge, and it commends or it condemns. All the time. It's going on in you all the time. That's right. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's right. Okay. So it's just, now, it's just a judge. It just says right and wrong. Now, the standard by which it judges can be right, or it, guess what? It can be wrong. And we all know this. Some people follow their conscience, and they do what is wrong. Surprise. How is that? Well, because the conscience judges according to a received standard. The conscience judges according to a received standard. In this case, some of their consciences were judging according to a standard that was wrong. So the standard in your mind, what you know or think you know, can be right or wrong. This type of conscience is referred to as weak. Okay? 
So if they ate the food contrary to their conscience, it would defile their weak conscience, which is described here as strengthening it. In other words, if you go against your conscience, what you're doing is you're strengthening in it. Okay? But this is not the correct way to, cre- to strengthen the conscience. We should never violate our conscience, ever. You should never violate your conscience, ever. Don't, don't do it. Okay? Well, how, how does the standard get changed so that our conscience will judge according to the right standard? Study the word. Being convinced in your own mind. Once you're convinced, then the standard has changed, and then guess what? Your conscience judges according to that new standard which you've acquired. This is why Paul is saying things like, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right? Romans 12. Your mindset has to be changed. Your way of thinking. As that changes, guess what? The conscience doesn't change. It's just a judge. (laughs) It just says right or wrong. What has changed is the standard by which your conscience judges. That's what changes. But everybody has a conscience and everybody says everybody's conscience says right or wrong. It's just that they don't all share that we don't all share the same standard. Um, we, where do we get the standard? Well, from training. People teaching us things. Reading the Bible, reading books. What, what, where, any source of information that we subject ourselves to is bringing information into our mind. And it is changing. I mean, it's constantly actually changing. Constantly. Just moving a little bit here and there. That's why it's so important to be in the Word, right? To be good, because this is where the standard of truth comes from, from the one true God. Um, there, may be other, there may be truth out there, but only insofar as it actually conforms to what's in the Scripture. So... Um, for these weaker conscience believers to be able to eat the meat sacrificed to idols, what is, what's going to have to happen? They're going to have to be more convinced in their mind that it's okay. They should not strengthen their conscience by just eating it under temptation or pressure. And we'll see why in a minute. Um, now, verse 8, the food really wasn't an issue. It says, food will not commend us to God. We're neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. I mean, it didn't matter, okay? We can eat or not eat. It's not better or worse either way. That's not really the issue. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. This is the big issue, okay? Um, If food was the only issue, it wouldn't matter where it was. You could eat it, whatever. It doesn't matter. In a pagan temple, it doesn't matter. But see, there's another issue, and that is exercising our liberty so that it becomes a stumbling block to a weaker conscience believer. That becomes the problem. Now, this word liberty is important. Take care that this liberty, we like this word liberty because we live in America and we say, hey, there's the Liberty Bell and all these things, right? Freedom. What, this word is exousia in the Greek, and it means a personal right, a privilege, a freedom, Uh, In the next chapter, Paul's going to talk about some of his rights as an apostle, and it's from this word freedom. He had certain rights, privileges, but he didn't take advantage of any of these privileges. He's going to give an example of how we can have all sorts of freedoms and rights and privileges, but that doesn't mean we should always take advantage of them and use them. Because if we take advantage and use them, we may hurt someone. And that's what Paul's saying in the next chapter. He's saying, I set aside my rights, I set aside my privileges for the benefit of others. And we should do the same. Okay? And that's what he's saying in verse 9. Take care that this liberty of yours, this freedom, this right, this privilege, does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak, those whose consciences are not yet able to judge according to the new standard that we have as Christians. Verse uh, 10. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple... Will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? Okay, and there's there it is. This is the clearest verse on the on the the idea that the main issue going on here is eating in a pagan temple, not just eating meat that was purchased in the marketplace. If someone sees you doing that, they have a weak conscience, eh, now this defiles their conscience, they eat against their conscience, which they shouldn't do, and now they feel like whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. They feel like they're worshiping the idol when they eat. 
And so for them, it, it's, it's sin. They shouldn't do it. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. Um, verse 11. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. The brother for whose sake Christ died. Now I said there's, a, there's always a theological truth in, in all of these chapters. And they usually relate to Christ and his crucifixion in the book of uh, First Corinthians. Very interesting. Chapter 1, the word of the cross. Chapter 2, Christ and him crucified. Um, chapter 5, Christ our Passover. Right. Chapter 6, Christ uh, redeemed our bodies, therefore glorify God with your body. Over and over, it's Christ and the cross and redemption and Passover. And here, you see it in verse 11. Why should we not ruin our brother through our knowledge because Christ died for him. So we're back to the death of Christ again. So it sounds pretty dramatic that Paul would say through your knowledge you can ruin a brother who's weak in conscience. What does this mean ruin a brother? Um, the problem is is that what, what this is describing is the fact that not only did he eat on that one occasion, but this may lead him into idolatry. Because these people were raised in the temples. They went to the cultic meals and festivals all their life. There were social occasions. They were how to have relationships in society. And now he's broken from that. He's in a new society, the church, a new community. But now you're luring him back into these activities, and it may ruin him in the sense that he is not able to escape the idolatry that you've introduced him back to. Now, um, this is the one for whom sake Christ died. In other words, when we think about what Christ did on the cross for us, we're, so, we're supposed to think about this idea. This is the main idea of the whole chapter and section. If you look around, you'll see people that Christ died for in this room. If you think around, you'll also think of other people for whom Christ died. In order to die for us, what did Christ have to do? He had to sacrifice his privileges. He had to sacrifice his own rights. I mean, who is he? He's God. He's God in the flesh, the second person of the Trinity. Philippians 2 expounds on this marvelously. Right? He condescended. He took to himself true humanity humbled himself, even to the point of death, death on a cross. He gave up his rights, he gave up his privileges. To do what? To give us life. So, shouldn't we be willing to sacrifice our rights and privileges for the sake of a fellow believer? 100%. I mean, if Christ did it, we should be exactly like him. This should be a no-brainer, right? So this is the theological root underneath all of Paul's exhortation to not cause a brother to stumble by eating based on some knowledge that we have that there's no idols, and therefore it's okay. Verse uh, 12, And so, he says, By sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Now, this is the only verse in the Bible I know where it ever says we sin. Well, actually, there's two I know where it says we sin against uh, another person. Because, you know, I mean, we all know. David in Psalm 51 says, against you and you only have I sinned. And everybody says, well, what about Uriah? <laughs> what about him? Didn't you sin against him? I mean, it was his wife. But David says, against you and you only. Well, that's because God's the standard. If there was no God, there'd be no standard. There could be no such thing as sin. Sin wouldn't exist. There has to be a standard. So how here can Paul say sinning against the brethren when we can only really sin against God? Simple. Because all believers are united with Christ. All believers are united with Christ. This whole game about sinning against believers starts in Matthew 18 on one of the earliest passages about the church. 
It says, but if a brother sins against you, go to him and tell him his fault. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. If you don't, you take how many? Two or three. You go to him. You get all the matters and facts in order, right? If he, if he repents, you've won your brother, right? Then it says, if not, then you take him before the whole assembly, assembly, church, ecclesia, and you know, put pressure on them. You, know, you want him to be reconciled. And if he, if he repents, then, then you won your brother, right? That's the first passage that talks about us being able to sin against our, our brethren, sin against another person. It's interesting because that's not anywhere in the Old Testament. What signals something is new going on. And what's new is that we are the body and Christ is the head. You can't sever the head from the body. I mean, if you do, you're dead. <laughs> I mean, that's it. So Christ is the head of the church, right? The, the church is the body. By sinning against the brethren, this verse actually goes on to say you're sinning against Christ, doesn't it? It says both. But that's because of the union between the body and its head, Christ. So in that sense, we can sin against another person. Okay. Now, we should never do this, of course. We shouldn't ruin our brother through our knowledge. Okay. We shouldn't sin against the body of Christ and wound an individual's conscience when it's weak. That's sinning against Christ. Okay, what, what should we do? Put others before ourselves. Put others before ourselves. I'm going to give you a simple acronym that I ran across, and it's popular probably in some Christian circles. Joy. Okay, because this is the key to joy. How are you going to have joy? Here you go, ready? Jesus first, others second, you third or last. If you put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, you'll find joy. Now the world says, no, you put yourself first, others second, and Jesus doesn't matter. That's a formula for defeat and a wasted life. And cynicism and indifference. Lostness, confusion, brokenness. But the key to success in life is joy. Jesus first, you put him first in everything. Others second, and yourself last. You say, but that doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem right. Don't we have to carve out time for ourselves? That's what the world says. That's all the world, and it will not lead to joy. It's selfishness. It's a wasted life. It's a wasted existence. The only way, and I'm sure you've experienced this, when you've given of yourself to others, there's some return that happens. There's a, a, a sense, a, a good, wow, I mean, it feels wonderful. You, you didn't create that in you. God did. God did. When you gave of yourself to someone else, sacrificially, whatever it is, helping them move, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It can be a simple thing. Giving of your time to help counsel them, to walk them through a passage, to help them in their relationship, uh, to help them in their job, whatever. When you're giving of yourself, not demanding anything in return, there is a natural, it's not a natural return, it's a supernatural return. God does something in you, and he, what he does is he's giving you joy. Because who taught us this anyway? <laughs> Jesus. I mean, he put others before himself, and he put himself last. And he will be first in the kingdom to come. This is a principle of Scripture, right? Those who are last shall be first. Uh, who will be greatest in the kingdom? Matthew 18. He who is slave of all. He who is slave of all. So, how, you know, the, all the disciples, well, am I, they, wanted to, they wanted to be the best. I want to be the best. I want to be the best of the king. <laughs> Jesus said, okay, well, come here. And he brought a little child. And he said, you have to humble yourself like this little child if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom. Children were not considered anything. You're going to serve a child? Jesus says, you be servant of all. Guess what? Slave of all, you'll be the greatest. Okay. So, I mean, this life is short, by the way. It's only 70, 80, 90 years. 
Eternity's forever. Your position there, whatever it is, will be forever. So 70, 80 years <laughs> to serve is really nothing in comparison to the eternal position that you'll share in the kingdom to come. You say, well, but I don't want to be the greatest. That's the right attitude. That's the right attitude. You say, but I don't want to be the greatest in the kingdom. Yeah, but he's going to make you the greatest anyway. So, <laughs> you know, it, that, that's, his, that's his prerogative. That's his rules. He gets to decide. If you've learned in this life what it is to serve, because what you're learning is what Christ did. You're seeing what he did. He, he didn't have to come down here. Bunch of morons down here. Filth. Who wants to come down here? After you've lived in here a little while, you're like, just get me out of here. I'm going to be here. It's nonsense. He came down here knowing what it was, fully knowing what it was down here, the garbage. I mean, he knows everybody's thoughts. Can you imagine? I can't even live my own thoughts. I definitely don't want to know yours. He knew everyone's thoughts in the history of the entire world. And he still came down here. And he still humbled himself. And he still condescended. And he still walked through this world. And he was still tempted in all things as we. And yet without sin. And he laid down his life for us. So maybe we could learn how to serve. You know. Maybe we could learn to be what he said. Slave of all. Because that's the way to greatness. So verse... Um, Chapter 8, 13, yeah. Therefore, Paul comes to a conclusion. See the conclusion of the chapter. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, Paul applies it to himself. He says, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Because that would show true knowledge, right? Because he'd be using his knowledge to love his brother and edify him rather than ruin him. Now, um, is this, this is not simply worth it, right, to sin against the body of, of Christ. Um, instead, we should love. We should put others' interests ahead of ourselves. So love is more important than knowledge. In an age of information, when all we're doing is checking Google to see what this means or that means, Acquiring knowledge. What is it that's greater than knowledge? Love. What did Jesus say in John 13? A new commandment I, I give you, that you what? Know more than everybody else? That you love one another. What's more important? Knowing more or loving more? Loving more. Loving more. Here's what a constable said as a summary of this chapter. He said, we should be... ...does not hinder someone else from coming to know Christ or keep him or her from growing in Christ. He's saying, look at how you're acting. Maybe your behavior is based in proper doctrine. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. What's relevant is that you're using that knowledge to build up your brother or sister in Christ not hindering them from coming to Christ if they're an unbeliever or growing in Christ if they're a believer, right? So we have to weigh everything that we're doing. This is, a proper, uh, this is knowledge properly acquired. It's a knowledge that takes into consideration others, their conscience, and what's going on with them. It's not just, well, the Bible says so, I'm going to do this. There's no, there's no such thing as demons. Let's go eat the best meat in town. Yeah, but what about so-and-so? Oh, I didn't think about that. That's right, because you don't know. You don't really know yet, as you ought to know. And because of this, you're not obeying God, and because of that, He's not unveiling Himself to you. He's not disclosing Himself to you. See, we have to think through what we know. I'm into this more and more, being a pastor over 20 years now. I actually don't spend a whole lot of time in here. You'd be probably be surprised. I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about what I know in here. 
I'm wondering how or why something is said or why the argument is made the way the argument is made. Because I already know the argument. I, I've got it. I've memorized it. But how, why is it here? And, and for what function is it serving in the text? It's called textual awareness. You don't, you don't just take verses out and say, I believe this because this verse says this. No, 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 that's not the way it works. You have to figure out why it's there. Otherwise, you'll be in left field somewhere. It's understanding that we're seeking. The Pharisees knew the Bible. They memorized it. But they didn't understand any of it. Right? They didn't understand it. The same thing with Judaism today. The same thing. They're still waiting on the Messiah. It's like, how did you miss it? You know, he's already come. He's gone. <laughs> how, how did you miss it? Ye who say the Kaddish, you know, all the time. It, it, it's, it's, it's wild. It's because they're not thinking about it. Like, these are brilliant people. Yeah, they are brilliant people. You have to think about how your knowledge should be employed. Uh, Ryrie said this, Here is the great principle that regulates conduct in morally indifferent matters. In this case, it didn't matter if you ate or you didn't eat, right? Verse 8, the, the, the meat's not the issue, who cares? He says, it is the principle of love voluntarily regulating liberty. It's the principle of love voluntarily regulating liberty. If you truly love others, then you will often forego your liberty, your right, your privileges. Why? Because you love the other person. And who said we should love one another? Jesus. And what did he say? If we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And he says, and then we will come to him and make our abode with him and disclose ourselves to him. I mean, do you really want to know God? Do you really want to know him? Oh, because there's so much more than 10, 10 doctrines with eight points each. Even Paul in Philippians 3 is, is praying that he would know him. The Apostle Paul. Oh, wait, you don't, you don't know him? I mean, I thought you, you know, you're the great Apostle Paul. He says, no, there's so much to go. If you're still here, you have a long way to go. I'm still here. Guess what? I have a long way to go. Probably longer than all of you. Because I want to know him. I want to know the power of the resurrection and how it is exemplified in my life. I'm not interested in natural results, what can Jeremy Thomas can do. I'm interested in what God can do through Jeremy Thomas. Because that's the only stuff that'll last. It's not the fruit of Jeremy Thomas that matters. It's the fruit of the Spirit through Jeremy Thomas that matters, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. It's easy to love those who love you. Try loving those who are unlovely. Jesus said, love your what? Enemies. And he says, this will be like little cooking pans on their head. <laughs> It'll drive them absolutely bonkers. And we've seen this illustrated. Remember on October 7th, the Hamas, the one family? The wife offered them cakes or something like that, two of the terrorists. They sat there for hours in the home. And... Uh, they, they didn't do anything to them. And eventually they left and were killed. <laughs> but the couple survived. It's like you're, you're loving your enemies. I mean, these people who are a severe threat, see, love does something to people. It's a scary thing if you really love someone who's even your enemy, what it can do to them. You know, this is, this is the stuff that we're supposed to be involved in. Not the natural stuff again. You know, I, I know what I can produce. You know what you can produce. And some of it we say, that's good. It's called human good. Human good. It's not divine good. It's just human good. Okay. What's divine good? That's something you can't produce. This is only comes when we live according to his commandments, which when we're living by faith. And then, I mean, that's what Paul says. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, it's when, it's, when, it's when Christ is living in you. That's the stuff that really makes a difference. And uh, is it hard to set aside your liberty? It may be, but when you have J-O-Y in mind, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, it's not hard. 
because you know the end result is J-O-Y. It's joy, and that's what you want. That's what I want. That's what we all want, isn't it? We all want joy. We don't want another hard day. We don't want another bad day. We, you, can, you can have those anytime you want. <laughs> the ones you want are the J-O-Y days, right? Hey, I'm telling you right now, there's a way to get to this. There's a way to have every day J-O-Y. And if that's a good enough formula for you, Jesus first, others second, yourself last, go for it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this text. Thank you that, you know, it's not just all about meat in a pagan idol temple. It's about brothers and sisters in Christ. It's about foregoing liberties, putting others ahead of yourself. It's about loving them. It's about building them up. It's about acquiring knowledge, but in a way that takes account of our brothers and it considers their conscience. And it's not, it's not oblique toward them. It is uh, careful toward them and concerned about them. And we know that this life is very short. If we can give up ourselves in this short life, then we'll find what life really is all about. And, of course, there's great reward in the future, which is all of your grace. So teach us these things and help us to pursue them and not forget them. We ask this in Jesus' name.